And so uh, we're going to end with another of our heroes who stepped in at the last minute, um, paleontologist Carolyn Levitt Busian, who is also uh, someone who works here at the museum as the paleontology collections manager. Take it away, Carrie. staying for the last talk of the day. All right, so I'm going to be talking about Ceratopsi limb bone histology, and don't worry, I will define that for you. There's a lot of big words in there. So um, my research topic is looking at Ceratopsi and dinosaurs and their metabolism, how they grew. So if you guys have been to our museum, and hopefully you've seen our horn section here, it's the best part of the museum, I see. Um, if not, you still have time after today. Go down into our pastoral gallery and you can see our horn section here. So I'm talking about the ones with the horn. So to me, that will always be Sarah from Land Before Time. Um, it could also be the Triceratops from Jurassic Park. The sick one. I always get sick or being eaten, but so it's just awesome. Um, or um, one of the coolest dinosaurs ever, the horniest dinosaur ever, that we actually have in our paleontology collection downstairs. So uh, you should see him. If you haven't seen him, go down there and see him today. He's so cool. And he's in the back corner. We have our own very nice horn section back in collections. So, um, so some of the goals for my research here is to figure out are ceratopsi dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? And uh, how did they grow? So um, what we have here is a uh, family tree of, a, uh, of animals. And um, what's interesting is we have, uh, if we're trying to figure out about dinosaurs, we have to look at um, some animals that are alive today. So uh, uh, unfortunately, the, um, we don't have any terrestrial dinosaurs anymore. We can't capture and release any ceratopsians, unfortunately, in the time machine. Um, but we do have crocodilians that are alive today, and we also have birds. Birds are the descendants of dinosaurs, and crocodilians share a common ancestor with dinosaurs. So that's a little bit of how we will know anything about um, dinosaurs itself. Uh, Ceratopsi dinosaurs belong to the group Ornithischian dinosaurs. So um, the problem with looking at crocodilians and birds as trying to figure out what dinosaurs are like is that they actually grow very differently and they have different metabolisms. So crocodilians are cold-blooded and they grow they grew slowly throughout their entire life. So um, uh, you can see See if I laser pointer, hooray. So um, we have a graph of the uh, uh, rate of growth um, on the right, and we have the x axis is age in years, and we have on the y axis the body length in meters. And you can just see it has steady growth the entire time it's um, growing, um, which is different than birds. Birds are warm blooded and they grew very quickly. And um, again, oh, I have an ostrich here because I think it looks most like a dinosaur. Um, cassowaries are also very similar, I think. Um, but uh, we have another growth curve here, and we have age in days in the x-axis, and the body mass in grams on the y-axis. And what I want you to see is that it grows really, really quickly. This slope is really, really steep. So it grew really fast, and then it reached uh, sexual maturity here when it plateaued. So that doesn't really help us too much because we have cold-blooded crocodiles that are still alive today, and we have warm-blooded birds who are the descendants of dinosaurs, so we need to figure out how the dinosaurs fit in the middle. So um, bone histology is the great way to answer these questions. So what does that mean? Histology is the study of microstructure. So it's the study of microstructure of anything, whether it's a leaf underneath a microscope or fungus or whatever, it's the study of microstructure. And it's great because it's a size-independent way of diagnosing age, because as you might know, just because something's really big doesn't mean it's an a, a, um, adult. It could be a small individual of a, uh, of a large species. So it's a size-independent way to look at stuff. And um, what I do is I uh, look at dinosaur bones under a microscope. OK, so to kind of explain histology, um, has anyone ever cut down a tree and seen um, a tree? <laughs> yeah, there you go. One person has cut down a tree. Hooray. Has anyone ever seen the tree stub? Uh, you see the rings, right? What do rings in a tree stub tell you? Age. Age? You have your hand raised so nicely. <laughs> the age, absolutely. How do you tell the age? By how many rings it has. Absolutely. So you count the rings, you can tell how old it was when the tree died. 
Um, uh, what else can you tell? By, by the growth rates. Yes. How much water? I mean, like the quality of like how the how the year was like. Yeah, absolutely. So how a year went? It's year wind. Whether there was like a forest fire, whether it had a lot of nutrients, whether it had, didn't have a lot of nutrients. Absolutely. What else can you tell? Injury. Injury. Absolutely. Anything else? Yeah. Change in tree shape. Change in tree shape. Yes. Yeah. The degree between rainfall. Absolutely. Cool. So you guys guessed a lot of them. So you can see, you can count the rings to figure out how old it was when it died. You can see a scar from a forest fire here. Um, the distance between the lines actually tell you how fast it grew. Um, so when the lines are closer together, it grew rather slowly, where it was fat, uh, a larger gap, it grew faster. So like here, it would have a faster year of growth, a rainy season, so you can see that. Um, so uh, it's the same thing as dinosaur bones. So you can cut open dinosaur bones if you're crazy enough to do it and see the lines. You can count the lines and figure out how old it was when it died. So these are both sections of dinosaur bones. So finding fossils is a challenge. We go and we get permits to where we want to dig. We walk and we're scouring while we're walking and we're looking for um, uh, uh, dinosaur bones. We look for color differences, we look for texture differences. Dinosaur bone sticks to your tongue when you lick it. So that's fun. So either you're lucky you find a dinosaur bone or you have a mouthful of mud. It's not good too. Um, and we then uh, excavate it. Or sometimes these excavations take years and summers. We bring it back to our uh, prep lab. It takes years sometimes to painstakingly clean off the dinosaur bones with all the tools that you guys can see from the prep lab. And then it comes up to me in collections where I measure it and I number it and I put all that information in the database and then somebody comes and researches it, and then we decide whether we're gonna put it on exhibit or um, keep it back in collection with me, and then I come along and say, I'm gonna cut it up. <laughs> so after all that time of getting it out of the ground, um, I, I cut it up. But you learn so much about the individual animal by cutting it open. So here's me, um, <laughs> with lots and lots of safety gear, um, cutting open the dinosaur bone with a uh, tile saw um, with a, a diamond blade on there. And I always make exact replicas of the bones that I'm going to be destroying, <laughs> enhancing, enhancing um, um, uh, uh, preparation. Um, uh, so this is a replica that I've made, um, and this is the bone that I've sampled. And you can see I've removed a chunk from the middle. So I always try to cut it the exact same spot because they're making it very standard. Um, it's becoming more of a general practice I found a new dinosaur species. Well, are you going to cut it up to see how old it is? Okay, so we all have to have a standardization for this. So here is a femur and a tibia and a humerus and a, all in an outline. I make a lot of measurements how long it was in addition to making the replicas. And I always cut it in the middle, the middle of the mid shaft to make it all standardized. So if someone were like, well, you're wrong, I can be like, well, I cut it right where I'm supposed to. So you can get my slides and tell me that I'm wrong. Um, so um, here's an example of a dinosaur bone, again, cutting it right in the middle. And so what you're seeing is the, the flat side up. So it comes out like this, and it's a flat side up. That's what you're seeing under a microscope. And this is uh, one of the ones I sampled here. Okay, so here's a diagram of all the neat things you can learn about um, cutting open a dinosaur. So um, the one problem about dinosaur bones is they're not as uh, good of a record as <laughs> Uh, trees are. Trees, you can count exactly how many rings it has and know exactly how old the tree was when it died. Bone, it uses, it leaches its nutrients from the inside of the bone and redeposits it on the outside of the bone. So you kind of have to do some fancy math to figure out which lines you've actually lost. So it kind of scrambles the early life history there. But still cool, still cool. So we have we count the lines, so you can see the lines. Again, you can measure the distance between them. This was a faster year of growth. Uh, rather than this one. And then we have blood vessels that run the entire length of our bone, inside our bone and alongside our bone. You can see that here, blood vessels running along the length of it. And when it um, comes out on the side of the cross section, it makes different shapes. So each one of these holes is actually where a blood vessel ran along the length of the bone. Um, and uh, if you're crazy enough, you count them. <laughs> You count all of the blood vessels uh, in the bone section to try to figure out if it was warm-blooded or cold-blooded. 
And if you're even more crazy, you can count the individual bone cells. Bone cells that actually fossilize after 75 million years of being in the ground, and that you can count them if you want to, to try to figure out if it was water blood or cold blood. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty neat that you can see all of that and kind of read the thin section as you're analyzing it. All right, so this histological analysis has happened for um, birds, who are the descendants of dinosaurs. So here's an ostrich here. And crocodilians, here's an alligator here. So a couple things you can notice. Well, there's a lot of holes in the ostrich. So that means lots of blood vessels, right? Not as many holes in the alligator. So they grew more slowly, it was cold blood. All right, so the answer, or the question is, what did ceratopsian dinosaurs do? All right, so for my study, again, love well, ceratopsians, they're my fave, um, I wanted to sample Cosmoceratops, which is nine, you can see downstairs, and you have Ceratops candy, which you can see in the window, I'm very exciting. Um, and they're both found in southern Utah in the Comparis Formation. Uh, these are the skeletons uh, that I sampled, and the gold color is are the fo bones that we found in the skeleton, and the red ones are the ones that I have histologically analyzed. It's a list, a fancy list of all the bones that I've sectioned. And, um, okay, so we're looking at the vascular density. So again, that's the blood vessels running through the bones, and we're figuring out the density. Um, so how many holes there are is basically what we're doing. So if you look over here, it has less of these large white holes, a little bit more, and then a lot, a large density of the holes over here. And then we also have um, those, those bone cells that I was talking about. Each little one of those black specks is a bone cell, and if you're crazy enough, you kept them. <laughs> so um, uh, we have lower density over here and a higher density. Here are some of the bones that I have sampled. Um, these are the uh, humeri uh, of uh, Utah Ceratops gedei that I sampled, and um, with um, uh, the side being on the left and the uh, anterior part being up higher. Um, and how would I go about counting these things? Um, I have a thin section down here of a femur of uh, Cosmoceratops. Uh, in Photoshop, I have made a nice rectangle and I uh, sectioned that off, and then made individually perfect size squares um, that I have blown up here, and then I count each one of the vascular canals and each one of the osteocytes, the bone cells. And this is a pretty picture. This is Cosmoceratops uh, femur underneath the microscope, and it can kind of again show you we have the vascular canals right here, these white ones, and the tiny black specks are the individual bone cells that are uh, 76 million years old. So, that's so cool! The permineralization process, the fossilization process, can actually record bone cells after all this time. Blows my mind. I think it's so crazy. Technical term. So, um, what did I figure out? Okay, well, um, it, looked, it looked more, to me, looks more like an ostrich, right? Lots of holes. There's a lot more holes. Um, which looks very similar to an ostrich as compared with an alligator. So um, I wanted to, the ceratopsians that I looked at, Utah ceratops and Cosmoceratops, were both large quadrupedal ceratopsians that lived in North America. Um, and I wanted to look, look at other quadrupedal ceratopsians that also lived in North America during this time. So I looked uh, at a paper by Erickson Druckenbeller, um, uh, another large quadrupedal ceratopsian called Pachynrhinosaurus. And this one is really interesting. Here's a thin section here, and you can see, you can count each individual one of these lines, and there actually is 18. 18 lines of arrested growth. So if you guys ever wanted to know how old the dinosaur got, it's not 140 years old. It's actually closer to 20 years old. Well, that's interesting. So this one actually wasn't done growing yet. Um, so it was 18, but it could have been um, a few more years to go before it died. Um, I also looked at Centrosaurus, uh, who was in Alberta, um, Canada, and also large quadrupedal uh, ceratops in here. And this is one of the thin sections that I uh, reanalyzed. And um, I counted the rings, and there was about seven. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, then Ineosaurus in Montana. This is the one that has a big hook nose. Uh, very cool, makes it a really good um, uh, bottle opener. Um, <laughs> I might have one. 
Um, uh, they actually have five lines of the rest of the uh, so this is Montana. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. So I was expecting something along the range of 18 to 5 when I was looking at Utah Ceratops and Kyle Ceratops. I didn't find any. I was very, very surprised that I found zero lines of arrested growth. I was very upset about that because I had all of this research on how to figure out how old it was when it died, um, and I, I, there's no, no lines of arrested growth for Utah Ceratops. Okay, all right, let's look at Kyle Ceratops. Oh, there's, there's zero lines of arrested growth, too. And, and one um, uh, suggestion on why that could be is it could be um, less than a year old. But if anybody's gone downstairs and looked at Cosmoceratops, that's an adult, right? It's a large animal, a large skull. So that, that wasn't the answer. All right, well, that's weird. Um, so I have this hypothesis, this idea. I plotted them on a map of um, what North America looked like in the Cretaceous. And we got Pachyronosaurus in Alaska up here, and then we have Centrosaurus in Alberta, Canada up there, Aeneasaurus in Montana here, and my Utah farm's down there. And I was like, huh, well, I wonder if the uh, climate is different in Alaska than it is in Utah, like it is now. Like in the Cretaceous, did they also have different weather? You know, long periods of darkness and, and um, long, you know, long periods of light. I wonder if that was the same. It turns out the records show that they did. They actually had a different climate than we do in Utah. And so that's my grand hypothesis. Instead of just crying that I didn't have any lines of rest and I have no idea how these animals are, I have this grand hypothesis that there was actually a latitudinal gradient in um, Laramidia at the time these animals lived. And you can see that in the amount of lines of rest and growth that they have. Oh. Um, another thing I wanted to look at is uh, Ceratopsian dinosaurs have a very interesting evolutionary history. They started out as small bipedal animals in Asia, with us Pachysaurus, and then they get to be, they're still small, but slightly bigger, um, Protoceratops here, um, quadrupedal, but still small. And then when they get to North America, they're large and quadrupedal. So we have the Centrosaurus here and the Chasmosaurus here. So I also wanted to analyze um, bones of the smaller forms to see if they had any, um, if they were different or, or same as my Utah forms. So here's Tachysaurus mongoliensis, and um, if I were to have any dinosaur as a pet, it would be this one. It's so cute. And again, another technical term. I love that thing. Play with my dogs. It's awesome. Um, uh, they're really neat. They're bipedal, like I said. They could probably do both because you also buy a of the foods, but bipedal and also quadrupedal. They had some neat um, spines on their back, too. Um, looking at their uh, bone microstructure, they had lines. They had lines of rusty growth, again, mine didn't, okay? So that's a difference. Um, they had, uh, there was no increase or decrease in the vascularity, so if you wanted to count the, count the holes, they actually had less holes than, than my guys did. Um, and they appeared to grow more slowly. So that's, that's interesting, the smaller bipedal guys grew more slowly than the um, uh, large quadrupedal guys. Um, looking at Protoceratops, it's kind of hard to see because it's a little dark, but you can see the lines over here, so you can count them. So lines are present, that's cool. Um, uh, uh, the vascularity is kind of hard to see, but you can see the vascularity there. They also appear to grow a little bit more slowly in the quadrupedal forms. Um, so what that all tells us is that not all dinosaurs grow the same way. So dinosaurs grew, some of them grew really, really fast, had a high density of vascular canals, had a high density of the bone tissue, really confident that they're warm-blooded, and some of them grew more slowly. So maybe they had colder blood, maybe there was an intermediate bloodedness going on, but the answer is we need to cut open all of the dinosaur bones and figure this out. Um, and so um, dinosaurs grow differently. So the, the, the smaller bipedal and quadrupedal ceratopsians seem to grow more slowly than the large quadrupedal ones did. Um, and then you can start comparing them between each other. So, uh, for example, in this graph on the left, um, we have uh, the crocodilians growing. Um, and again, they're just growing slowly their entire life, being cold-blooded. And then we have Meosaura here, which is a herbivorous dinosaur um, uh, quadrupedal. And it grew really fast. So it grew to sexual maturity in five years. So that slope is really, really fast. Uh, again, having aging years on the x-axis and body length and meters on the y-axis. 
And then right where it plateaus off is where it reaches sexual maturity. And then it, it plateaus off here. So that's a, a large quadrupedal dinosaur. And then the same thing's been done for T-Rex. Everybody's favorite. I've been asking everybody, and they're like, oh, T-Rex. There are a few people that, <laughs> that haven't had that as their answer. Um, again, we have age and years in the x-axis and body mass on the y-axis. And you can see that the Tyrannosaurus rex growth curve takes a while. The steepness is over here by uh, age, between age 10 and 15. But it takes a while to get going. And then it reaches sexual maturity over here by age 20 before it plateaus off. So the herbivorous dinosaurs appear to grow faster than the carnivorous dinosaurs that ate them. Anybody have any idea of why that would be useful? Food source. Food source, right? What can run away? So the only defense mechanism they had was to grow as big as they could, as fast as they could, and have lots of babies and be successful, right? And you can see that. It's so interesting. And so again, you've got to cut open everybody, cut open all the dinosaurs, and figure this out, because we can figure out the difference between how they grow, the rate of growth between these dinosaurs, and if there's a difference between the different things that they ate, so the herbivorous dinosaurs and the carnivorous dinosaurs. So, um, with that, I want to um, welcome you to visit the horn section downstairs, and then you'll think of me when you see it, because they're my fave. And um, we have, uh, you can now see that they're actually a um, family tree. It's a cladogram. So you can see the um, protoceratops dinosaurs over here, the early um, uh, Asian forms of the quadrupedal ones down here, so that branches off first. And then we have the centrosaurs on the left and the chasmosaurs on the right with Cosmoceratops right here that you can see in collections, the Albuceratops that you can see in collections, and the Pseudoceratops that's down in collections. Um, and uh, think of me when you see it. And um, I'd like to thank the following people, and I know that was a lot, so I know you're going to have a lot of questions, so thank you very much. research that's been done on modern birds also in the equator. So um, that's another thing to, to look into in both modern birds and, and uh, I think they're finding this. So, yeah? Similar to what John was asking. Um, so considering that you have ceratops and you have ceratops are both cathosaurians and that centrosaurus and duenosaurus and anusaurus are all centrosaurians. And if, if you want to test it there, just because of the latitude, wouldn't you want to find some so maybe some that pseudoceratops with some uh, central to come back up and see if it's consistent with the um, latitude and not having the coordinates. Yeah. Absolutely. So what he's saying is I sampled mostly chasmosaurines and I compared them to centrosaurines and perhaps they grew differently. And uh, how would I test that hypothesis? So uh, yes, we have Nasutoceratops in collections and uh, I've actually cut them open already. <laughs> so I'm trying to test my, test my uh, results too. And what's interesting is um, Nasutoceratops has two, two lines of rest. Um, which uh, is still very low. So again, you'd, you'd expect to see, or I'd expect to see, you know, 18 or, or something higher, higher than that. But it's still a very, very low number. So it's interesting that it does have lines, but um, but yeah. So I have to cut up more things to try to figure that out. Like saw happy here. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, are you familiar with Jack Moore's proposal that dinosaurs uh, grow basically in the transition and then degrade? Basically, like the uh, Taurosaurus is actually just a really big triceratops. Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, Cosmoceratops to me, I, I totally think it's an adult. I'm not saying I'm looking at it, it's totally an adult. So, um, uh, they, there's a lot of views that um, these ones are just juvenile forms of, of adults, or they're all triceratops. And I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. I do think that they, they um, are warranted to have their, be their own species. Yeah, so I don't have to stain them, so no, um, it takes a lot of work to grind them down to be transparent, and the colors that you see are actually the colors that 
that you see me do that. Um, we do have a uh, calcite plate that we put in, um, in the microscope um, to look at the Sharpie's fibers and, and some more stuff with the microstructure. Um, um, and that turns it all pink, so it's all really pretty too. So I've put another couple pictures of that. So it changes the color of that, but we know we don't actually have to stain anything. Actually, they're all casts. They're all replicas. And the skulls, um, uh, not that we're headhunters or anything, but they are the most important part of the uh, skeleton. It's the most um, unique part of the skeleton. And so they're really, really important. And they're also really heavy. And we would want them to fall off the, the, um, the wall. Um, and so because they're important and they're really heavy are the main reasons why we didn't mount them. And um, the way that we have them oriented, that, that seems like gravity. It would be playing against gravity and they fall fall off, so, um, yeah. So a, a good rule is if anything is behind glass, it's more likely real, and if it's not behind glass, it's more likely a replica. Not the case for everything, but it's, it's a good thing to figure that out. Yes? So when it comes to like counting the rings and seeing how much time is left, how do you know like how much time per ring, like it's like one ring per year or two? Like, how do you yeah, know? one ring per year. Like, like, it's like, how, how do they know that it's one ring approach to one year? Um, it, it's comparing it to modern analogs. So um, they, they tend to put down a ring when the body's putting, uh, having some stress um, on it, and, and it links annually. Um, so we're just comparing it to modern analogs. Anybody else? Um, although we still need to cut open more dinosaurs to actually have them flat toe off because a lot of times we get them early on. Yeah. One more? If you've gone on a search for modern analogs that would also have latitudinal variants in lag, mammals, avians, etc., to see whether they're folks running to you know, the same species but latitudinal variants in lag. Yeah, more papers to read and more studies to find for sure. So it's, it's interesting to see the studies that have been done on the very extremes, um, like in the, uh, um, um, the uh, equator um, area of the tropics and then also in the polar regions. And um, more and more people are doing research on that and more and more papers to read. So more to compare it to my study. Thank you.